hemodynamic monitoring. Let's begin with a scenario. Here we have a 12 year girl who presented to us with fever, cough, rapid breathing, progressive lethargy. The heart rate is 170 per minute in sinus rhythm with cold peripheries and delayed CFT. She's hypotensive. We know that this is a hypotensive septic shock, focus being pneumonia. We started on oxygen, started on a fluid bolus, antibiotics and vasoactives are initiated. A 40 ml per kg fluid bolus has been given, epinephrine has been started, but she is still hypotensive. Now the question arises whether to give more fluids or add more vasoactives. Over the next 5 minutes, we will be discussing on what is hemodynamic monitoring, the questions to be answered from the monitoring and what are the tools currently available for monitoring. Hemodynamic monitoring involves tools and methods that help in measuring the pressures and volumes inside and outside the heart to detect the need for any therapeutic interventions. It began in the 16th century when William Harvey first gave a detailed description of the circulatory system. Later, in the 17th century, Stephen Hales began invasively measuring pressures in horses. It was then followed by Riva Rossi, who described the spignomanometer, which really pushed forward the boundaries of hemodynamic monitoring. Let's try to understand heart being a pump connected by pipes. The pipes which bring the blood towards the heart forms the preload, and the pressure against which the heart has to pump forms the afterload. In order to have a good perfusion, there should be adequate filling, adequate contractility and a normal systemic vascular resistance. What happens in shock is either there is too less to pump or there is myocardial dysfunction where the pump failure occurs or the ASVR can be very variable which can be either cold or warm. The questions to be answered while monitoring these babies are is my child hypovolemic, normovolemic or hypervolemic so that we can decide on giving fluids or to give diuretics. If there is myocardial dysfunction, we can start them on inotropes or we can titrate the afterload in case of vasoplegia or vasoconstriction by giving either vasopressors or dilators. We all know by the Frank Starling law that the stroke volume of the heart is directly proportional to the end diastolic volume, which means the larger the volume of blood flowing into the right ventricle, the blood stretches the cardiac muscle leading to an increased force of contraction. But the problem here is only half of the patients are fluid responsive. It is important to identify where we exactly stand at the Frank Starling's curve so that we don't give excess fluids when the patient is not fluid responsive. Monitoring can be classified into non-invasive and invasive monitoring. Conventionally, non-invasive monitoring parameters include heart rate, pulse pressure, saturation, non-invasive blood pressure monitoring, skin temperature, capillary refill, urine output, and also mentation of the patient. Invasive monitoring can be done by various catheters. By pulmonary artery catheter, one can measure cardiac output and various other parameters. A central venous line when inserted can help us in measuring central venous pressure. An arterial catheter can help measuring mean arterial pressure. Pulmonary artery catheter is considered to be the gold standard of invasive monitoring. It can provide valuable information about different parameters when placed accurately. However, there are several disadvantages. It is costly, invasive, and there are multiple complications associated with placing this catheter, especially in pediatric population, like arrhythmias, catheter looping, balloon rupture, pulmonary artery injury, and pulmonary infarction. In one of the earliest multicentric trials conducted in critically ill adult patients, the use of pulmonary artery catheter within 24 hours following admission was found to increase mortality, length of stay, and healthcare cost. This was followed by another study from the French group which suggested that early use of pulmonary artery catheter did not significantly affect morbidity and mortality in patients with shock or ARDS. Subsequently, meta-analysis showed that there was no significant 
impact of the pulmonary artery catheter in critically ill patients in terms of mean hospitalization or mortality. As one can understand, over the last two decades, the use of pulmonary artery catheter has reduced irrespective of the indication. Pediatric data is limited to observation studies, case series, and expert opinions. It is still relevant to be used in certain populations, especially those who have pulmonary arterial hypertension and shock refractory to fluid resuscitation and vasoactive agents if the unit is comfortable in placing the pulmonary artery catheter. For short of pulmonary artery catheter, the alternatives include central venous pressure monitoring and arterial pressure monitoring. Central venous pressure describes the pressure of blood in the thoracic vena cava near the right atrium. The normal value is about 2 to 6 mm of mercury. It is considered as a surrogate of intravascular volume status, right ventricular function, and may even reflect left ventricular filling pressure in patients with good ejection fraction, normal valves, and normal pulmonary status. It is important to note that any systemic venoconstriction or decreased right ventricular compliance or obstruction to the great veins, and if there is a tricuspid regurgitation, the central venous pressure may be very variable. Also, the mechanical ventilation of a patient may also alter central venous pressure, especially when one is delivering high PEEP. On studies, central venous pressure failed to discriminate between responders and non-responders. So low CVP may indicate hypovolemia and high CVP may indicate hypervolemia. However, the degree of hypo or hypervolemia does not correlate with CVP value. So extreme values are of some clinical significance. However, CVP alone should not be used to predict or guide fluid resuscitation. Coming on to arterial pressure monitoring. Arterial pressure can be done non-invasively either by intermittent inflatable cuffs. It can be measured either manually by auscultatory or palpatory method or automated using oscillometry. One can also measure continuously by volume clamp methods and arterial ablation tronometry. During arterial pressure monitoring, a cuff is placed on one of the major arteries, preferably the brachial artery, and the cuff is inflated above the systolic pressure. During the cuff deflation, as the arterial blood flow starts, Karatokov sounds can help in predicting the systolic and diastolic blood pressures. In invasive monitoring, these oscillations are transduced and the oscillation with highest amplitude reflect the mean arterial pressure. The systolic and diastolic blood pressure are derived using algorithm in invasive monitoring. When compared to invasive and non-invasive monitoring, Arterial catheter monitoring detected about twice as many hypotensive minutes when compared to non-invasive monitoring. But when the oscillometry values were titrated at every 5-minute interval, these benefits were obviate. Hence, reiterating fact that more frequent monitoring is essential rather than the type of monitoring. Note that non-invasive blood pressure monitoring may be higher than our invasive pressure monitoring at lower pressures and lower than invasive pressures at higher pressures. It is important to measure the intensity, that is the depth of hypotension, and the dose, that is the cumulative time spent in hypotension, and both of which can be better monitored with invasive arterial pressure. The arterial pressure waveform is shown in this figure. Here, the rate of upstroke indicates contractility, the rate of downstroke indicates systemic vascular resistance. The farther out the dichrotic notch, the lower the systemic vascular resistance. The site of arterial catheter placement is also very important. As one can see that the mean arterial pressure, irrespective of the site of arterial catheter placement, essentially remains the same while the systolic brush pressure increases as we go farther from the heart and the diastolic blood pressure decreases as we go farther away from the heart. Pulse pressure variation is given by the difference between maximum pulse pressure and minimum pulse pressure over a single breath. It can be done either manually or automatically. It is important to note that 
Best values are obtained when there is absence of spontaneous ventilatory effort, absence of right heart failure, and minimum tidal volume delivered is more than 8 ml per kg. Pulse pressure variation of more than 12% is considered to be a significant predictor for fluid responsiveness. Similarly, stroke volume variation, which indicates the change in the stroke volume over one mechanical breath, has been shown to be another significant predictor for fluid responsiveness. Systolic pressure variation, which indicates change in systolic pressure over one mechanical breath, may also predict response to volume expansion. Coming back to the original figure, we can use static variables like central venous pressure monitoring or dynamic variables like pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation in order to predict fluid responsiveness. However, the more important question is, will my fluid bolus translate into a better cardiac output? The cardiac output monitoring is very important as it translates into improvement of mortality if the cardiac output is improved. We can measure cardiac output by several measures. Few include pulse contour analysis, transpulmonary hemothermodilution, echo and esophageal dopplers, partial carbon dioxide rebreathing or NICO, thoracic bioimpedance. Pulse contour analysis involves arterial pressure waveform analysis with a standard intra-arterial catheter. A catheter is placed and pulse wave is analyzed by different calibrated or uncalibrated system which will give us the cardiac output. In transpulmonary thermodilution, a central venous catheter and a large systemic arterial catheter is placed simultaneously. The central venous catheter is used to inject ice-cold saline and a drop in temperature is measured using a thermistor in the arterial line. The difference in the temperature helps us in determining the cardiac output. Different parameters can be measured by these two techniques. When we combine the thermodynution and pulse contour analysis, we get better results. Most of the modern cardiac output monitoring devices, including the volume view and PICO, combine the thermodynution and pulse contour analysis methods. Non-invasive pulse contour analysis using volume clamp is recently being explored. Here, the cup pressure is maintained such that the finger volume stays constant even through the arterial pulse. Cuff pressure pulsations waveform are then of the same shape as intra-arterial pulsation waveforms. Partial CO2 breathing or NICO uses FIC principle for measuring cardiac output. This also can be used only in ventilated patient and cannot be done continuously. Thoracic electric bioimpedance uses constant low voltage electrical current and identifies thoracic or body impedance variation induced by vascular blood flow. So we have now highlighted the mod various modalities which help us answer this question. The preload can be determined by static variable like central venous pressure, pulmonary artery opening pressure, or dynamic variables like pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation. Cardiac contractility can be determined by thermodilution or pulse contour analysis devices, which can give us stroke volume, cardiac output and cardiac index and several other parameters. So what to use and where? In any case of acute circulatory failure, we go by our clinical findings. If there is access and availability, it is always preferred to put a central venous line, an arterial line, which can help us give central venous pressure, central venous oxygenation. Arterial line can give us mean arterial pressure, pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation, and also can help us determining oxygenation and ventilation. Lactate is also another useful biomarker in monitoring the patients while resuscitating them. Echo is a key modality and we will have a separate session discussing on how to use echo in circulatory failure. Based on these modalities, with the therapy, if you are having a positive response, we continue with the same monitoring. If there is insufficient response, one may consider thermodilution or pulmonary artery catheter placement. 
This technique is especially important if there is an associated ARDS where certain other measurements like extravascular lung water can also be very helpful in managing these patients. Finally, tissue oxygenation as a response improvement in cardiac output can be measured by NIRs. In the future, not very far, we will have non-invasive, easy to use, wireless and wearable devices which are AI driven. In summary, continuous measurement of all hemodynamic variables is preferable. Combine and integrate the variables wherever possible. Correlate the readings or findings with the clinical picture of the patient. No hemodynamic monitoring technique can improve the outcome by itself. The skill and vigilance of a trained observer to interpret the information is the most essential component of hemodynamic monitoring. If you like these videos, kindly like and subscribe these videos.